This is just something I'm playing around with, uh, and so I don't know that we have to go very far in it, but in case somebody wants to talk to me, I'm thinking a lot about infrastructure, um, and so there's that. Uh, and we've got the physical, we've got the information and technological infrastructure, and then we've got the social and relationships infrastructure. And so um, I think I spelled all the words right at least. It's, a, it's an early list, but that is really how I think about the work um, that a lot of us are clearly doing, what you all are figuring out to call social impact. Um, we're gonna do as, as long as we you know, go and somebody please call time on me, because uh, we do have a righteous break. But this work uh, project was 93 to 96, and it was working with New York City's Department of Environmental Protection. I include the budget, because this, this stuff costs money. And uh, it was a huge project, and I'll say about the evaluation part, you know, uh, it wasn't a topic then, it was just something I knew that when I was down in the tunnel and no one would speak to me, um, except one guy, and then, you know, after the show I was down in the tunnel, and uh, one of the miners came over and surreptitiously opened the backpack I had on and put a heavy rock in and said, this is for you. Um, it was a 250 million year old rock. And he wanted to thank me in his terms for that show. Um, I knew, and then how many people come, I mean kind of basics, but just evaluating uh, who comes, who brings their family, who talks about it, who talks to you. In that culture, there really is about knowing uh, a culture and staying long enough to really listen it to understanding enough, the language, the ways they do. Um, abundance was four years, uh, and I interviewed 30 multi-mills and 30 minimums. The one thing we came away with, we ran out of money or whatever uh, afterwards to really not get to do the kind of evaluation and kind of ongoing project I was hoping for. These are some of the questions that for the dialogues, um, a lot of workshops, uh, the carriage house here, the Jungles family hosted uh, several Rhode Island Foundation. And one of the evaluative measures was people stayed, even in Seattle and on the boards and in New York City at Dance Theater Workshop, the audience, the show was 90 minutes, the play. The audience stayed for 90 minutes afterwards for the talk back. We were that desperate to talk honestly about money. Uh, this is what got me to Portland, Maine, a show that's the mayor on the right, Mayor Dusan at the time, Lucien Matthew, uh, Micmac. And this is Maine, this is Portland now. It's not Maine, it's Portland, Maine now. And so uh, again, people st stayed and it took a year. I spent one week, a month up there for an entire year. And even a week and a half before the performance, people assured me they were not going to be in that show. Um, and what I think is helpful in terms of what I've learned is that the promise of getting, that we're all born and eager to actually be challenged in a thoughtful situation, maybe a scary situation, but a thoughtful situation, and that people, including the mayor who said, what is this contract for? I told you nine times I'm not gonna be in the show. And I said, I know, I know. I said, and you don't have to be in the show, obviously. Who could make a mayor be in a show um, that opens in a week and a half? But uh, I said, I thought, just at this workshop today, you might feel you couldn't pass it up getting to be with these people, talking about their lives honestly and openly. And she was, and she did an amazing job. Art at work, out of that, um, 2003, I just started thinking, what if the, the, the power and the transformative, what everyone here is already, has their hands and el their elbow deep in the power and transformative uh, impact of the arts. But I thought, what if they're applied to the city governments, to municipal practices? What if the federal government starts freezing up, the state government starts freezing up, and the challenges only increase. Who's gonna be really on the dime to actually figure out what to do? And I came up with municipal governments as the likely candidate, and so launched what's now called Art at Work, which was for municipal governments to figure out how to incorporate and integrate arts making and arts projects to tackle non-arts problems. And it's in Holyoke as of last year, so here's that kind of talk at some of our supporters. Is it okay not to read it? You just read it yourselves, or should I read it? 
This project I already referenced, it's uh, to raise the morale and uh, lots of good stories. Some of the stuff, we have a very uh, robust, I like that word, uh, robust website, artatwork.us, uh, that you can explore. Um, these are the officers. Uh, they never knew there was a poetry reading, that there was something, that, that it was even an event that could happen. So it took them a year to decide to write poetry. And it took a death of a, of a colleague who it came out at his memorial that he wrote poetry to agree for them to write poetry. And it also took a bit of a command from uh, an officer who they respected to write the poetry. But once the second year, and again, an evaluative moment was once the first group for the first year realized that writing poetry hadn't turned them gay, or <laughs> anyone gay who wasn't already gay, um, twice as many officers volunteered for the next year and wrote twice as many poems. I had to say, everyone, everyone, it's a calendar, for God's sakes, lighter and shorter. <laughs> uh, Public Works had a high incidence of uh, racially based discrimination lawsuits being filed within their own department. Very expensive for a city to deal with. Uh, I went to corporation council where my office was for the first few years. A, a, a lot of it, whispering like I'm going to blow the big case. You know, I'm going to find out something in corporation council in Portland, Maine is going to like blow the lid off. Um, but anyway, uh, I said, well, what, what about this? They go, oh, we won every one. And I was like, oh my god, like what does winning mean when you're fighting, you know, multiple discrimination lawsuits within your own agency? So we did these workshops with a remarkable artist named Daniel Minter. Uh, they did story workshops and across of the whole staff talking about reclaiming their heritage, their actual heritage, rather than their whiteness. And uh, it's almost an entirely Caucasian department, so they reclaimed being Italian and Greek and Russian and Irish, and then did these blocks. And we didn't have money for this project, but uh, I love those cups, so I try to put that in any time I can. Um, another project, uh, Health and Human Services, uh, actually, they had, there was one department in the whole city that actually had a significant number of people of color from other countries and from the United States born here. Uh, and that was, I thought in terms of visibility, that was a good strategy just to kind of celebrate and give higher visibility to that department for the other departments in the city. There's a staff of, a, I think we have about 1,800 in the summer, and including part-timers and 1,400 year-round. City Writers Group, I won't, just because of time, uh, all their writings uh, are both at the parking garage. You know, if you go to the parking garage, this is Don Burns. You'll see that by the elevator, and you'll also see it at City Hall. The same with the treasurer's lovely work. It's, it's on the line. Um, and it was very tough to convince them to write about work, but once, you know, they, we had to kind of very hard negotiations went on there. And, uh, I've come from a construction background, so I'm good at negotiating. Um, this is our police chief. He's now the police chief in Detroit. Uh, chief Craig, James Craig. And I have this slide in here, uh, a couple evaluation moments. Um, those calendars, half the officers were partnered with a professional local photographer, and half were partnered with a professional local poet. So the calendar had photographs by each of those, and poems by each of those. And this was at an opening of a regional uh, crime lab in Portland. And you know, lots of politics, lots of issues, why not? But the chief called and asked if we would hang an exhibit throughout the four-story building of the photographs. So there's a good indicator, right, of being integrated. Uh, one of the officers, about a year later, on uh, her own initiative, uh, organized a, a building-wide photography exhibit of archival photographs from the police department, entered it in the first Friday, you know, listed it in the first Friday, made up cards and had 250 citizens come and see the exhibit on first Friday, which is a big deal in Portland. Um, all, the, you know, another indicator that this is actually happening. On the right, I've got a second picture. It's of the janitor's door, uh, the custodian's door in the police station. And uh, there's several references to things that happen with the calendar. So again, if you go looking, you know, if you kind of have the time and the kind of mental capacity to think evaluatively, you can kind of like search stuff out. 
Um, the police in 2010 shot and killed an armed man, David Okad, a Sudanese man who they'd had several you know, experiences with. Everybody knew everybody. And it uh, had a huge impact on especially the youth in the community. Um, the police were scared someone else had reported someone else had a gun in the building, so they were completely focused on that and, and, and were very you know, disrespectful from one perspective about David's body, um, which you know, really kind of ended up being the, the, the match. And so uh, groups of young people, primarily African-born, were throwing rocks and bottles over 15 incidents with Portland, Maine. You know, for any municipality, obviously, that's a huge, huge, huge uh, spiraling, increasing, escalating situation. They obviously identified the city, so it wasn't just the police. They were surrounding police cars. Portland is, uh, you know, in Maine, is obviously hugely... Uh, 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 economically driven by tourism, and uh, and so there it was. And the police chief, James Craig, uh, called and asked if uh, we could write and I could write and direct a play with the officers uh, about their lives and their work for the high school students as a way of addressing what was getting out of control. And I thought about it, and it was hard not to just say yes, but I realized it was very close to PR, so we met. And I said, this is, I really appreciate you calling. I think it's a great idea, but it's, I'm here to actually transform the police department, not just kind of quell civil disturbances, uh, justifiable or not. And so after a quite intense negotiations, he agreed that I could work directly with the officers who are more likely, quote unquote, to cross a line. Um, the, you can read the performance also then included uh, a second performance. We called it Four City Times. Radio calls was what the police's performance, the officers was called. The Weeping City was uh, nine African-born youth, high school students who did a play about their relationship to the police. And again, without money to do a proper evaluation, uh, the incident stopped, so that's one measure, right? But even more uh, to the point was uh, the officers office across the force reported just multiple being approached by young people, youth-initiated you know, sense of a relationship and a positive engagement, asking them about that. The same thing happened with Police Poetry Calendar, but with the high school students, it was very different. But here's the end, and it's not all warm and fuzzy, so this is that remarkable a picture. Um, it was an extremely challenging project in all ways I hadn't necessarily anticipated. Um, you know, so municipal workers get targeted and obviously the more disaffiliated, is that a word? Unaffiliated? The more disenchanted, the more whatever. Uh, the public is with the government, uh, the, the, you know, it's hard to have a good relationship, it's hard to get the things done that need to get done, but also the more um, in charge the public feels about the government and uh, that they are the drivers, uh, the better that can be. And so we took on uh, the issue of unions. Portland has very uh, weak unions. Uh, Maine is not a union state by any means. I coming from New York and having helped and been, and been in unions, I, um, I, I, I'm a strong believer in covert goals and overt goals. And uh, so I had many covert goals for all of my projects that I wouldn't talk about um, openly in the you know, presence of anyone. Uh, and then overt goals. And so I think in terms of the ethics of this work, that's just a good thing to kind of mention, that I think it's, it's actually legitimate to have things you're thinking of that you can't figure out how to make it an overt goal, but it doesn't mean you can't have it. So to have the unions, the police union, everybody said one good covert goal was everyone said nothing good about the president of the police union when I started. I mean, really bad things. And I was so surprised they said them without any shame and just very boldly to me. And so that was one of my covert goals, was to actually get new leadership in the police union that actually was leadership that people respected. And that was achieved. The same thing with the public service union, where the you know, people talk about them, the shovel leaners, the this and the that. So this project um, gave uh, six public, seven public service workers a chance in front of about 125, 150 people to talk about their lives and their work. And all this is on video on our site if you're interested in poking around. Um, Portland Works, uh, I don't know if you can see this that clearly, it was 50% city staff and 50% community leaders. So it was clear that 
you know, the grassroots community leaders in Portland were only engaging with the city when there was a crisis, when David Ocott was killed, when taxi cab licenses were on the line. And I thought, let's try to see what's possible using creative engagement to create relationships um, that are already in place to some degree. And this is the artist Daniel Mentor I mentioned. This is a, a, a workshop at Preble Street Resource Center organized by Homeless Voices for Justice. Can you talk more about the evaluation stuff? Yes. I know you solicited emails from regular faces. Yeah, one of the, one of the uh, things is when you get an email uh, that has any evaluation uh, content in it, just resend it to yourself, but add the word impact to the subject heading line. So then you can do a quick search and see all your impacts when it comes time to actually evaluate or, or write something. It may be a quote, it may be somebody said something, because so much of it is so scattered and accidental. Um, and also write it to yourself. You're talking on the phone and someone you know, says something or you hear like in, in after meeting place, they're making a huge garden in the area where we put a fence. And it clearly was one of the outgrowths. And so I just wrote a quick you know, note to myself and emailed it to myself so I could kind of like get a hold of it fast. Um, keeping a file folder, I think a big thing in terms of evaluation techniques is really getting everybody on board and actually taking the time to train the participants and the people working with you and the volunteers to think evaluatively so that they can recognize it and add to the file and make it clear where the file is, that they're gonna stick their things and so, after we did a, a fairly significant fence art project for one neighborhood, um, a lot of fence art projects started popping up all over town. So, uh, you know, taking snapshots, iPhones, whatever of that, and keeping that file is that helpful? Yeah, and I think that you you actually worked with a consultant for evaluation for the Art of Work project. Is that right? And I was just wondering if you could talk about how your approach changed after, after that experience and what you were able to sort of transfer to other projects. Right. Did you, I started in the beginning just talking a couple things about it. I worked with Chris Dwyer. I still do. Chris Dwyer from the RMC Research in Portsmouth, but it's also out in the West Coast. And she's the one who really helped me. She's got stuff online. She works with Animating Democracy a good deal and she's got forms and things that we went through to say what are your outcomes and again this ended up this is what I was referring to in the beginning when I talked about how do you bridge to municipal employees how do you bridge to the leaders of the Somali mosque you know in one of our neighborhoods as talking about that and having people articulate it so that was big and then figuring out how uh, evaluation can be designed to drive your outcomes and getting people's agreement uh, that that's the way to go and that art could actually do it. Uh, nursing assistants, you know, we, the city of Portland owns a, um, a long-term and short-term health facility, which is a little unusual for a place so small. And uh, the CNAs are being disrespected, you know, not an unusual situation, and the least paid are also the least respected and the most targeted. And so uh, a story project, the. The, the administrative uh, directors got it right away that a story project made into posters and put, put of their stories that they worked on, of what meant to them, what their work meant to them, posted in the elevator staff only elevators, posted in staff areas, so not for the general public, would actually make it almost impossible to kind of perpetuate that level of confusion and, uh, and disrespect figuring out how you can just, it's not art-based per se, but we did a, a community plant, which was an outreach program with one of the neighborhoods and planted 20,000 sunflower seeds uh, in one day. Uh, there was four different neighborhoods for our town project, and uh, it's taken a year to kind of recover uh, from that. But one of them was this, it was art cards. So trying to reset this, each neighborhood was targeted with a different stereotype. Bayside in Portland is targeted with being a social service center dump. And so they've got a lot of issues. They have a very occasionally energetic and proactive and also hostile uh, neighborhood association. And so these were 30 cards with 30 stories. The prints were each by Daniel Minter. And they got passed out at like stores and businesses and libraries so people could in, in one way of talking about it, reset their neighborhood identities. 
um, of what is Bayside. And I, there was no evaluation done you know, after this, uh, so that's not as pertinent. But, uh, and then Libby Town had a stories poetry project. So banners, 100 of these banners were around the community. Libby Town was destroyed uh, in the late 60s with a 295 coming up through an interstate. It was a very uh, power, together, integrous, uh, working class community and had been for decades. And people knew each other and just filled with stories. And it really was shattered. And you can imagine the city employees would say, can you not say shattered? And I was like, oh, oh uh, destroyed? <laughs> <laughs> and this is our, our mayor, our current mayor, Michael Brennan, at uh, one of the openings, you know, identifying where is the community gathering. Anyway, this happens to be Tony's Donuts, which was really the heart of Libby Town, one of the few establishments that has survived since the 60s, where their motto is, life is short, eat dessert first. Um, and I found that when people have a prop, I'm sure many of you have found that too, when people have any excuse, the story can follow. But just being asked for the story can be quite a, quite a hurdle. Um, and uh, so these yellow cards were their prop. And so as soon as they had that, they could talk. Uh, or the block print was the prop. And I have learned that making art is just extremely frightening. I'm assuming everybody here has noticed that. Uh, scary for people, really scary. And, uh, in the Portland Works and the Meeting Place, we did uh, neighborhood workshops where an art form was coupled with a civic topic uh, once a month. So uh, leadership and followership was one of the skills topics. And we did singing, choral singing together. And I told people the, the, the month before, don't tell people what we're going to do. I had seen it just doesn't work. People won't come if they know they're going to be asked to make art. And uh, I said, don't tell them. Just tell them that you think they'd like to you, they'd like it, that you like it. And so my favorite moment was uh, someone who's now the new president, which was one of the overt goals, was to get kind of effective, inspired leadership in place in the neighborhood organizations. Um, he walked in the door with someone who turned to him as the door opened, who said, singing? Like that. And I was like, singing. Uh, one of the neighborhoods is uh, the neighborhood in Portland called West End, if some of you know it and know Portland, and that was uh, identified as a very wealthy neighborhood, which isn't accurate, you know. But, uh, and their project was photographs, and people uh, across the neighborhood were asked to take, uh, invited to take three photographs, one of a place in the neighborhood that had meaning and merit to them, one of a person in the neighborhood, stranger or friend, and one from inside their home, and that was the prompt and the prop that allowed an amazing number of stories to come. And again, uh, for evaluative measures, are you asked back? Uh, do they suggest a future project? Um, do they have another idea about what you could do? Uh, or do they do something? And I think this happens, obviously, just people are people. Do they do something clearly related to what you were doing and, and, and think it was their own idea, right? Uh, just some of the photographs that were taken. And this was the exhibit, you know, just figuring out ways to make stories. Um, I don't know that it makes sense. Does it make sense to show more of this? Uh, is that interesting enough, or should we go to questions and answers? This is East Bayside, very uh, tough economic. OK, great. Let's go for questions. Yes? Um, I, I went up for uh, uh, about six trips on my own dime for, for 2006 and just met with different people. And Nathan Cummings Foundation has been supporting the project at a level which at least allows me to be there and to do some project work for seven years now. So that's been um, that I came with that guarantee. And the arrangement is... Uh, that the city pays for my uh, office, they pay for the tech help, they pay uh, my health insurance, and they match any retirement benefits. And then I provide this grant funded position. So, um, in a careless moment, they agreed to. <laughs>
there is a situation where you locate distrust and you turn it into trust. And that's a very, very hard thing to quantify unless you can get people to come to you and actually see your work in action. Have you had luck in engaging higher-ups, funders, uh, and others in getting them to come to you to see your work? And how do you then turn the story to explain to them how you turn distrust into trust? Uh, did you hear my PSA at the beginning about my mind? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll do what I can with that. Um, so I think listening is core, is a core value. I think it's the missing transformative agreement, uh, ingredient in any exchange. Really listening, aware listening, listening where you at least are pretending to look like you like the person. And when you are distracted, you return to your best effort at paying attention to what they're saying. And that it isn't a conversation, that it's actually different than a conversation that you are only listening if it's your turn to listen, and they are only listening if it's their turn. So that's basic. And um, I think that's, uh, that plus art making is, is uh, explosive. Um, and one allows the other to happen, I think. Uh, and getting people there, I think, ingenious, you know, whatever clever way. Uh, I knew the miners weren't coming to Dance Theater Workshop. For those of you who don't know it, it's a, it has a different name now, but it's New York downtown art space, performance space. And uh, there's no way the Sandhogs, which is what their nickname is, were going to come. So, but I knew if they saw the show that they would be much more likely to come. And obviously, them seeing the show was integral to the whole project, in my mind, for reaching the goals I had set. And, uh, and so I held a $100 ticket memorial fund to to uh, build a drinking fountain to honor the people who had died. 25 had died at that point. And they all showed, like 200 of them came. And we raised $20,000 in one night. And so it's just being clever as you can, I think, and really understanding the culture. And is that asking someone who they respect to you know, host it, is it, whatever it is. The funders question, I'm a little less uh, certain how to address, but I am, uh, for the first time, starting to scheme about having a, a, an institute up in Portland uh, this summer, starting with about 30 interested people who would buddy up and do 10 projects with different city departments over three weeks, and we'd evaluate. So our time here, here, our time, I think, is over, right? So uh, in that insight, highlight, delight, maybe turn to that person you introduced yourself to and just share one of those. And if you want to share it with me, I'll be here the rest of the time. Thank you.